As Oasis announced their reunion after 15 years apart and fans clamber for their parkers, anything and everything with a Stone Island badge and forgo their rent to secure tickets, they'll also be digging out their Decca logo t-shirts, an essential bit of kit for any fan and an iconic design that might have become bigger than the band. Everywhere you went in the 90s you'd see that logo. It was a symbol of the people that's been effective since day one. And as Oasis stormed on to be on one of the most successful bands in history with eight number one albums, it's held even more weight. I want to be mobbed me everywhere to go. I want to be chased by those birds and that down the street going, Liam! Let's get into how that logo came about and how it's still impactful over 30 years later. Rewinding back to 1993, Groundhog Day was in the cinema, Pepsi Max launched with this ridiculous advert, Pink and Yellow Troublemaker Mr Blobby was topping the charts, Blobby, Mr. Blobby. and Oasis were pretty much unknown. They had no fans, You've got no, friends. no record deal, no logo, and Noel Gallagher was like, we need to sort that. Just prior, Noel was living the dream as a roadie for Manchester legends, the Inspiral Carpets, to the point he thought that was him set. And I met Graham Lambert from the Inspirals, and I got that job as on the roadie. I thought, oh, that's it. This is it, you know, and that would have done me. Quick side note, it was the Inspiral Carpets tour poster Noel and Liam had hanging up in their bedroom that inspired the Oasis name. One of the stops was the Oasis Leisure Centre in Swindon, which sounds like somewhere you might find Alan Partridge doing a tour. Aha! <laughs> and Liam actually ended up playing there in 2011 with BDI. On their UK tour, the Inspirals were being supported by Liverpool band The Real People. It was here founding members and brothers, Tony and Chris Griffiths, met Noel and hit it off. Unfortunately, Noel ended up getting fired as a roadie. For being unprofessional and somewhat unapproachable by various tour managers. But The Real People stayed in touch. Yeah, we've just known Oasis for a few years. We met Noel and um, when we were touring with the Inspiral Carpets, we've been friends since. Tony and Chris liked Noel. They liked his band, so they offered to record Oasis when no one else would and get their first ever demo tape down, the live demonstration tape. They travelled back and forth to Liverpool over three months, recording in the Griffiths Stock Road studio, knocking out 12 tracks, eight of which ended up on the demo tape and many of those songs ending up on Definitely Maybe. But just the tape wasn't going to cut it, they needed a cover. Noel reached out to the Griffiths' pal, Tony French, and commissioned him to create one inspired by the Union Jack you can see on the wall at the Broadwalk rehearsal space Oasis used. Tony worked his magic using Quark Express and manipulated the flag to create a swell which was meant to represent Oasis' mind-bending music. And then he applied a type to it, and for all the type geeks out there it's a universal black. No, I was uh, mad for it. That's the best thing I've ever seen. He thought it looked like a flag going down the plug hole, which represented the state of British music and uh, Britain in general at the time. The total number of British living under the European level of poverty has risen from 5 million to 14 million. He actually asked Tony to add the plug to it, but luckily, like, Tony knew what he was doing and just didn't bother. <laughs> the design was then run, minus the plug, and only 10 copies were made. A couple of days after Noel's 26th birthday, Oasis played their pivotal gig at King Tut's in Glasgow on the 31st of May 1993. They weren't even scheduled to be on the bill, but not only did they manage to play, their demo tape also landed in the hands of Alan McGee. It's not about like whether you're into or whether you're major, it's about what, what you believe and what you stand up for really. Alan was co-founder of Creation Records and had previously signed My Bloody Valentine and the Jesus and Mary Chain. After watching Oasis play, he said he didn't even need the tape because their performance sealed the deal and he signed them. I really do believe some things are meant to fucking be. I was standing there with my kid sister Susan. She immediately went, you should sign these. And I'm like, let's hear the second song. And it was like, I'm signing these. And third song, I'm definitely signing these. And we loved being on Creation. I loved every minute of me being on Creation Records. It's the greatest fucking record label you could ever wish to be on. The first bit of official merch they ever sold using this logo was at a gig three weeks later supporting Dodgy at a Hoppin' Grapes in Manchester University. And when I say first bit, like, they literally just sold one, which is probably rare as rockin' or shit now. 
One was also given to iconic British graphic designer Brian Cannon of Microdot, who was in attendance that night. Brian had worked with another culturally significant band, The Verve, while they were still called Verve actually, designing the artwork for their first single, All In The Mind, and their debut album, A Storm In Heaven. And before I started working with Oasis, Noel got me the gig doing the In Spangles album. Noel was a big fan, so I asked him to get involved with theirs. So that was that then. I thought, right, off we go. The first port of call was the logo. Now at the time, magazines and press ads were often done in black and white, and the current design didn't work. On the 28th of October, 1993, Brian met with the band in Sheffield when they were supporting the BMX Bandits. He took along a book or record sleeve to see what they were into. Importantly, in this book was the Rolling Stones number two album. What blew me away by this was, there's no type on the record. It just has the picture of the Rolling Stones and the Decca Records logo. The Decca Box logo wasn't unique. EMI also had a box logo, but it was the positioning that really drew Brian in. It was subtle, but very effective. And at the time in the 60s, covers would have the band name on there, they'd have the song title on there, and were very much in your face. So this was quite a dramatic and very bold move. Brian would spend so much time conceptualizing the album cover. He didn't want to ruin it plastering type all across it. He enjoyed the nuances, granular details and symbolism he could add with his art direction. He'd also go on to have his mum and dad in Oasis covers. He just loved telling a story in small details. So the Decca approach was actually ideal. What they needed now was a font. The obvious first step was going for Impact, a similar compressed font like Decca, but it didn't quite fill the box enough. He then took inspiration from influential Swiss graphic designer Joseph Muller Brockman, also his typographical hero, and went for Accident's Grotesque Bold, but it was a bit too in your face. Brian took inspiration from the Adidas font for obvious reasons and used Futura, but it wasn't quite right. And this is all kind of sounding like Goldilocks and the Free Bears, but trust the process because then came the first proper mocked up take, an italicised version of Futura, but Brian decided it looked a little bit too much like Usis from a distance. If it was going to be small and placed in the corner of a record sleeve, it needed to be legible. If you look at New York City's subway system, a place that's completely completely hectic and needs legible signage. They use Helvetica for good reason. Because it's the most legible font there is. Obviously, Brian went with this, slightly tweaking it to Helvetica black italic, and the iconic Oasis logo was created. So Swindon inspired the Oasis name, the logo was conceived in Sheffield, designed in Brian's bedroom in Wigan, and digitised by Brian's assistant, Matthew Sankey, in Blackpool and Fylde College, because Brian didn't have a computer and I didn't even know how to use one anyway. These places also happen to be the UK's most popular destinations for hen parties. Paul, I don't want you turning up ruining my hen night, right? So you can go where you like, but you're not to go in the dragon, the miller, the wheel of the pelican, the cow's head. Interestingly, Blackpool and Fylde College didn't actually have Helvetica black italic, so the type actually had to be skewed to give it that appearance. The new logo made its first appearance in a press ad just before appearing on the supersonic sleeve Oasis debut single on the 11th of April 1994. From there, Microdot went on to create all the record sleeve artwork for Oasis in the 90s, from Supersonic, like we just said, all the way through to the master plan. It was simple, but really effective. As Oasis surged in popularity, you just couldn't escape that logo on merch. It was absolutely everywhere. And 15 years after the band had split up, it's back again to promote their reunion tour and still looking as bold as ever. A true sign of a timeless, iconic design. Massive thank you to my channel members and Patreons who support this channel. You can join them in the description below. Here's a couple of other videos you can watch until I'm back again soon. Spotty dog.